So good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us at City Lit for the first virtual Bibli Oracle event with Chicago Tribune columnist, AKA the Bibli Oracle, along with his friend and co-host, Gavin Guilfoyle. Since 2012, John has been writing a column on books and reading for the Chicago Tribune. Each week, telling uh, people what they should read next based on the most recent five books they've read. If you'd like to join the book queue for a recommendation tonight, send a list of the last five books you've read and we'll see how many John has time to answer. In addition to writing as the Bibli Oracle for the Chicago Tribune, John is the author of seven books of fiction, nonfiction, and humor. Most recently, uh, Why They Can't Write and The Writer's Practice. He has 20 years of college teaching experience and writes about issues around teaching, writing, and academic labor for inside higher ed. He's a native of Chicago. Um, he currently lives in Charleston, South Carolina, and works as a senior analyst and communication strategist for Willow Research of Chicago. Kevin is the best-selling author of the novels Cast of Shadows and The Thousand, as well as the memoir A Drive Into the Gap. He is also a screenwriter of the award-winning comedy Chasing the Blues, and in previous careers, he was an Emmy-winning copywriter, a member of the Houston Astros front office and a domestic servant. Um, John and Kevin have worked together before. They've hosted and served as commentators for the annual online event, the Morning News Tournament of Books, and they are co-writers of the number one best-selling My First Presidentiary, a scrapbook of George W. Bush. So please join me in welcoming them to City Lit Books. Thanks, Teresa. John, are you, I don't know, can I see you? I can't see you, there you are. I see you too. How are you, buddy? I'm, I'm pleased to John, see that you have John not I used to live embraced the, the coronavirus. I have not embraced the what? The corona beard. I, uh, oh no, I, I did. And I shaved it off for you. Oh, okay, good. I had to. Good. Um, my, uh, my brother, who uh, I know is watching, uh, looks like an 18th century mountain man right now. <laughs> <laughs> so John and I uh, used to, we're old friends. We used to live in the same city for a long time, and, but we, we talk frequently, but we hardly ever see each other. So this, is, this isn't even like work for me. This is a social call. But John, I think a lot of people who are watching probably familiar with the Bibli Oracle uh, column, um, but uh, probably a lot of them don't know how it started. How did how did this idea um, get its start? Some more than oh, ten years ago. Right. right? So my my origins. Uh, well, first I want to want to get a shot of the T-shirt. It's going to be backwards <laughs> on the screens, but it's a Logan Square T-shirt. Uh, in honor of City Lit, bought at uh, Wolfbait and B Girls, another Logan Square shop, uh, store, which I think okay. is open for curbside service. So please avail yourselves of that. Um, yeah, I started my book recommending career um, as a human display in my mother's bookstore, the Book Bin of Northbrook, Illinois, which she started with three partners when I was a year old. And uh, when the store expanded and had a children section I would just go there and read books and if somebody came up and needed a book for a kid they would ask me what what should we get and I would recommend like a Matt Christopher novel or um, a kids biography of Bobby Orr or that kind of thing and uh, we'd all go out happy. Um, the Bibli Oracle itself um, Kevin as I think you remember it, it was um, tied to our work with the tournament of books where for those of you who aren't familiar, it's a March Madness style tournament where two books face off against each other head to head every day um, for a month, working in their brackets towards a championship. And Kevin and I are the color commentators. And um, after a couple of rounds, we run out of things to say. We've already talked about the books. There's nothing left to do. So on a whim one day, I said, anybody who posts the last five books they read in the comments, um, on the post itself, on the on the matchup, I would recommend what they should read next. It was just a, a total win. And at the time we were having like maybe 20 or 30 comments 
her matchup and all of a sudden 150, 180, 200 people came out of the woodwork and wanted a, a book recommendation. So um, I started doing that periodically for, for the morning news. Um, I would get on and do like live recommendations through chat. And then um, Kevin, you, you have a big role in how I, I became a contributor well, to the Chicago Tribune. You were doing it not just in the tournament of books, but occasionally the morning news would just host you uh, independently of that, and, and we were getting uh, hundreds of people. Were were right? You would spend. I remember you would spend hours, way, way longer than you thought you were, out there recommending books, fielding these recommendations like a hockey goalie, like batting these <laughs> things up. And it was awesome. And I happened to be at a party at Tribune Tower here in Chicago, a book party. Um, and the Tribune. This is around 2011, I think. And the Tribune was about to launch a new book section. They had a book called Printer's Row. For a, ran for a while, it's no longer in existence, but a beautiful full color book section in every Sunday paper, it's gorgeous. And I was talking to the books editor at the Trib, Liz Taylor and her assistant, and they were talking about, they still were looking for content for this thing. And I said, you have to look and see what John is doing at the morning news, because it's great fun and people are really into it. And so they checked it out and they, and they called you up and, and offered you a column. Yeah, the rest is history. That was, I looked it up, um, before uh, this afternoon in planning for this, and that was February 2012. Wow. I, wasn't in, I wasn't in weekly to start, but pretty quickly it became weekly. And I looked up the first three books that I recommended, which were uh, Savages by Don Winslow, which was later Great made book. into an Oliver Stone movie. Um, Cruddy by Linda Berry, Chicago's Linda Berry. Oh, yeah. I think we still get to claim her as, as one of our resident geniuses. <laughs> and uh, Stoner by John Williams, which is one of my all-time favorite novels. Right. Um, and thinking about Don Winslow, <laughs> Kevin and I have been, this, this is off topic a little bit, uh, Kevin and I both followed Don Winslow on Twitter. <laughs> and he, he claims to have some sort of inside compromising material on Lindsey Graham that he is prepared to spill if something goes down. So he's a, he's a bit of a character on Twitter. Um, so I've... I've you know, I've been doing it ever since. Um, it's it's become um, such a part of my weekly habit of just thinking about books. Like when I when I read something I like, or when I read about something in the news, and um, I get excited that I have six hundred words every week to talk about it in the Tribune, and it's been particularly um, meaningful at this time, right? With everything that's going on, we're were isolated and shut in. And um, about a month ago, I about what a hard time I was having reading. I thought I was going through a kind of grief experience. And I got probably 20 or 30 emails back from other people who were saying, oh, my goodness, right? that's what's going on. That's why I can't read. Uh, it's sort of the shock of it. So I, I'm glad to report that I'm back reading. I think a lot of people are. Um, it helped me to turn off the news. I'm not watching the news anymore. That has helped me <laughs> a lot. Um, but I suppose we should uh, we should kick it off. Um, I've prepared some recommendations. Yeah, because you got a big response when we, got a we big announced response. That we, were we, do had, it. we had over a hundred. I stopped counting at hundred and thirty requests. That's great. Um, we're not going to come near that. Um, but what I did try to do, just a little background, I tried to pick some lists where there was a lot of overlap with other lists. So those of you who are tuning in, you might not see your list. Like, oh, but my books are on that list. These might be good recommendations for you. I tried to pick for variety. In a couple cases, I tried to pick so I would have an excuse to recommend books that I just wanted to <laughs> recommend. Um, it's, it's my show, so I'm, I'm doing it the way I want. Um, we should mention that if you order any of the books I recommend tonight, uh, City, and you order them through City Lit, they'll give you a 10% discount. Um, and they have curbside pickups, so you can do that online, or I think you can call them through the phone. Teresa will correct us at the end if that's incorrect. Um, and at the end of this, I'm going to uh, give two um, longer lists of books. Um, I got a bunch of emails in prep for this from uh, people who are saying, and I really am having a hard time reading during the, the pandemic, and do you have any recommendations? So I have two lists. One is for those of us who feel like you need a good cathartic cry. <laughs> At this time, you're like pent up and you need to let something loose. Um, and then the other is if you need books that are a true diversion from what is, is going on, something that can capture you. 
So, Kevin, I'm going to try my technology. Right, let's see how this, let's see if we can deconstruct how this works here. Put it up. See, if, see if this works. I'm going to do this. I'm going to share the screen. And are you seeing a PowerPoint or a blank, a blank screen? I think I'm seeing your desktop. How about now? I'm, I'm looking at the, uh, I think I'm looking at podcasts you're listening to. Oh, you're looking at Zoom. Okay, hold on. <laughs> Let me try it Which again. <laughs> See if this works. Does that work? There we go. Yep, now we got it. Okay. So this is Lisa B's list, Chicago, Illinois. Uh, Valentine by Elizabeth Wetmore, who is a Chicagoan, and I think she just did an event for City Lit, if I'm not mistaken. Um, this is Happiness, Neil Williams, Driving in Cars with Homeless Men by Kate Weissel, The World uh, That We Knew by Alice Hoffman, A Good Neighborhood by Teresa and Fowler. So I have read none of these books. <laughs> um, I've, I'm actually midway through Valentine right now, and it's fantastic. It's really, really gripping. Um, I'm familiar with Alice Hoffman and Teresa and Fowler's work. I've read books by them. So in this case, um, my recommendation is um, what we call um, gut instinct <laughs> or guess, kind of based on this. Um, a, a, a penchant for literary fiction, for um, books where care has been taken with the prose, as far as that goes. So my recommendation on this is, what just happened? Uh, a Children's Bible by Lydia Millet, which um, is recently released. I just finished it a couple weeks ago, and it is mind-blowing. She's one of my favorite novelists. I recommend anything she reads. And um, it's, not a, it's not an easy read. It's, it deals with um, climate change and, and some of those issues. Um, but it's, it's, it's very powerful and even funny. Somehow it makes the end of the world funny at times. Um, second book, S.E.B. from New York. I hope you're on. Um, the Heat by Sean Adams, which is one of my favorite books of the year so far. A very uh, bizarre um, sort of Thomas Pynchon-esque novel. The Little Hitler, Ryan Budino, James Slayer, Sherry Browning Irvin, which I'm going to Irwin, which I guess is a, a some sort of reference to Jane Eyre. Favorite monster, Sharma Shields. Look how happy I'm making you, Polly Rosenwake. Um, these are sort of like offbeat, quirky, these sorts of books. Um, that puts me into mind of a, a similar offbeat, quirky, perhaps funny book. And this book is called The Bear Went Over the Mountain by William Kotzwinkel. And you can see from the cover there, um, it's a bear in the midst of New York City. And it is literally about a bear who uh, finds an abandoned manuscript in the woods and picks it up and wanders into New York City and he is mistaken for an eccentric author by a literary agent and publisher and he becomes um, famous um, making appearances and it's it's a satire on uh, publishing and authorship and this sort of stuff and um, people might know William Kotzwinkel's other book he, he's, he's wrote for children and, and uh, other things so um, it's it's a favorite book, and I wanted a good excuse to recommend it. So, hey, hey John, um, can I can I interrupt you to ask you yeah. a question? <laughs> so, sure. like in that instance, like Jane Slayer, which is a book I personally haven't heard of, and I don't know if you had or not. But would you go and sorry, right, I, I don't know what I don't know what that is. Would you go Google it? Will you look it up? Will you read reviews of it, or are you still just going on your gut instinct? When um, I will. Yeah, I'll I'll get information. I'll like read the description. Um, I try not to um, buy anything from Amazon, <laughs> um, but I do make as much use of the excellent database they they have of of books and information. Right. Um, they they uh, for a while there was was uh, this idea of of um, showcasing where people would go to bookstores and then they'll buy them on Amazon. Yeah. Um, harming, harming bookstores. Um, I like to do um, reverse showcasing. <laughs> right. I will go to Amazon and 
research the book and then I will order it from my, my bookstore. Um, Joel R, my next um, person, I mean, Joel. I don't See, know. I, I, I just want to say I am very proud of myself. I've read four of these five books. I'm very. I, pleased. I just want to say yeah, that I'm no, pleased I've, I am I've, with myself. I've only read three, um, so maybe we should. Okay, so maybe we should have, have some fun here. Maybe we should have. <laughs> maybe we should put you on the spot and see. I don't uh, know. Let's think about this. See if anything comes to mind. Um, sort of in real time. So, so we can sort of talk this through. Um, one of the things I, um, one, of the, one of the things I, I, I started thinking about when I, I think about a, um, a recommendation is sort of like, what do these books have in common? And so the spider came in from the cold, gone girl comedians, like there's a certain amount of suspense, right. mystery, um, plotted books, um, with stories, so I think okay, they 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 go towards that. Plain song by uh, it's actually Kent, not Ken. That's probably my fault. Um, that's more of a charactery, um, deep meditative look. So I'm I'm looking maybe for a little thriller or suspense novel with some substance to it. I have an idea. I have I actually have. Okay. I want to hear yours first. No, no, no. You go first. Oh, I go first. All right. I'm yeah. thinking this. This might be a little on the nose, but. I see uh, uh, Spy Came In From The Cold on there, uh, Gillian's book, Graham Greene. I am being pushed a little in the kind of literary spy genre. So I'm thinking like a book like Charles McCary, who's a brilliant uh, uh, former CIA agent, right, wrote spy novels in the great spy novels in the 70s and 80s and into the 90s, I think. So like The Tears of Autumn, I think is a great book by him. I think that would be my, my recommendation. That's excellent. I, I don't know him. Um, so that's, um, that's fantastic. I mean, it's, uh, this, this is sort of the magic of these things where it's, you know, it's really dependent on, on what you know and, and um, what you've done. So uh, I actually forgot what I did for this one. Oh, so I went character. Um, so this is, this is perfect. If, if we want to suspense and spy um, with Kevin, Charles McCary. Um, I went with Mrs. Bridge by Evan Connell. Um, people might remember the uh, movie, Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Bridge, starring Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward, which was made from this book and its companion, Mr. Bridge. Another one of my absolute favorite books. It's written in um, short little chapters, paragraph one chapters, um, where um, we get these insights into the characters. Um, just bit by bit and the story accrues over time and it just builds this emotional power that's, that's amazing. It's a book that I pick up. I won't read it, reread it in its entirety um, every year, but I'll just sort of pick it up randomly and just sort of remind myself of how great it is. I would, I would sort of kill to write a, a book that good um, at some point. Yeah, that's really, I, that is really interesting the way we, we both took those things and went in, we, we sort of, you can cleave those books in half and I went on, you know, I, I grabbed this half of all those and you grabbed the other half. Yeah, and it's, it's really interesting. Uh, you know, I, I make a, a, a big show in the column about how special my <laughs> talent is as a, as a joke. But the reality is it's just, uh, you know, and uh, taking a moment to reflect on books. Like what are, what are these books and what do they mean to you and, and um, what might they mean to others? I, uh, I have a question that I, I've never asked you before, I don't think. Sure. Which is, and I, I'm a terrible, I'm a, terrible recommender of books because I am a coward and I it will uh, recommend very safe books that I know lots of people like. I do that all the sure. time. And so, right, but when somebody asks me to recommend a book, I say, well, all right, tell me, tell me about books that you like, right? right? And, and then I will, I will try to work off of that and then I will try to, and then I will always just recommend Lonesome Dove. Every time. That's <laughs> what I order. Good recommendation. But, <laughs> but you not, but you say, give me the not the, don't tell me the five of your, of your favorite books. Don't tell me the, the last five books you liked. You say, tell me the last five books you read and don't ask them whether they like them right. at all. You don't want that information at all. No, in so fact, there's people. Why, why is that? So there's people who write to me um, and, and want a recommendation. They will tell me their five favorite books and I, I ignore those. So that's a, a little bit of a pro tip for those of you who want in the column. <laughs> 
Um, if I am recommending a book juxtaposed against your five favorite books, I am going to likely fail because I now have to climb the bar of your five favorite books. And Kevin, I don't know about you, but like every year, you and I read a lot of books, right? Um, every year I read a handful that are really, really powerful that, you know, I, I would put up in a quote unquote favorites list. Now my favorite is in the hundreds, but you know, if I read 60 or 70 books a year, that's pretty good. Um, so I just want to know what they choose for themselves when they choose books. And that tells me a lot about the sorts of things they're drawn to, the things that they find of interest, and I can work from that. The other um, personal mission I've given for myself in this um, particular role, self-appointed role, is to, whenever possible, I try to recommend something that people may not be immediately aware of. Um, a book like Gone Girl or um, uh, uh, Little Fires Everywhere or Amora Toll's books, these, um, these books, the books that live on the, on the um, frequently bought table, these are the ones that readers are already aware of. And um, that is the work of Amazon's algorithm. If anybody has really studied Al Amazon's algorithm as I have, um, you essentially can begin to see that really is just if somebody bought another book, and, uh, two books, they, they get in each other's recommendations. There were three so years there where you would get recommended Gone Girl no matter what books you had read. <laughs> right, right. Because everybody had read recommended Gone Girl. Right. <laughs> right. Um, or uh, our friend Anthony Doerr's All the Light You, right. you Cannot See. Like, it's just that book was everywhere for a while. Um, and and well-deserved, by the way. There's, there's, um, they're both very, very fine books. But part of my mission, I see my mission, is to um, uh, try to nudge people towards things maybe they forgot about or haven't heard of. One of the troubles I get is I I'll often recommend books that I realize afterwards are out of print. People have a hard time getting their hands on them. Um, but there's libraries and used books, so um, I, try to, I try to keep them alive. Um, is there any live, are there any chat ones? Yeah, can let, can I, let me pick one out of here. And uh, um, okay. uh, let's see here. Uh, OK, here's one. Uh, My Wife Said You May Want to Marry Me by Jason B. Rosenthal. Finding Meaning, The Sixth Stage of Grief by David Kessler. Mm. I'm, seeing, I'm, I'm getting a theme here. <laughs> Hour, a theme. Hourglass, Time, Memory, Marriage by Danny Shapiro. Uh, so Very Much the Best of Us by Brian Doyle. And Marriageology by Belinda Liscom. Mm. Okay. Is, uh, uh, the yeah. There's a definite theme there. Um, so we got... A lot of a lot of uh, books about marriage, marriage and grief and trouble. Uh, do you know that? Do you know that Jason Rosenthal book, Kevin? That's that's Amy Krauss Rosenthal's husband. Oh, is it really? Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's wonderful. Amy Krauss Rosenthal, uh, uh, Chicagoans will remember her as an old uh, friend, acquaintance of ours. We did a reading with her many many years ago. Um, passed away he's sadly a, few years he, ago. He's, and he's a wonderful guy. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, it's a it's sort of a memoir of him dealing with her her passing, and she she wrote a very um, uh, right. viral op-ed or a piece in the New York Times um, recommending her husband for marriage. Um, That's right. And I actually just heard a podcast with him uh, where he was interviewed, and he talks about how um, difficult that was to deal with. Not just that she was dying, but that this this attention had been put on on him and their family um at the end um so i've cheated a little and i made myself a master list of about 400 books um so i, might, I didn't get caught by a brain fart um and i'm gonna i'm gonna recommend a book that um is by one of my favorite writers a guy named charles baxter who is not famous famous but he's he's had some um successful books one of his books, um, A Feast of Love, was made into a film um, probably about 20 years ago now. Uh, and this book is called Saul and Patsy. Um, and it is a, it is a, a novel of a marriage, a, a couple living in Michigan. Um, he's, a, he's a great writer. 
another um, deeply moving story. Um, whatever he's one of the writers, whatever whatever he writes, I pick up and and read um, sight unseen. And I got to see him at a reading um, here in Charleston like four or five years ago, and uh, I brought him eleven books to sign. <laughs> I was that guy, <laughs> and he came, uh, and it was uh, it was very gracious and. and I and I'm going to read Jason Rosenthal's um, book too now that you have uh, called to my attention because yeah. Amy was a absolutely unique person and a wonderful soul and a great writer and uh, I would I would love to read about her. Um, um, all right. I have another one. I have one here that is clearly a tournament of books okay. fan, so I'm going to I'm going to throw these at you. You ready? Okay. Uh, Your house will pay by Steph Cha. The Water Dancer by Ta-Nehisi Coates. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of my favorite books of last year, Mary Toft or The Rabbit Queen by Dexter Palmer. Uh, Girl, Woman, Other by Bernadine Evaristo. And, and The Mirror and the Light, here's the curveball, The Mirror and the Light by Hilary Mantel. Mm, okay. Whew. Uh, so there's some historical fiction in there, right? There's a little... Um, experimental is maybe not the right word, but certainly, certainly not tied to strict realism. Right. But, but four of those five books were entrants in the tournament of books. So in I'm the assuming they were chosen because they were in the, they were in the tournament of books. This makes it tough. So one of the things we know about people who are um, readers for the tournament of books or uh, viewers of the tournament of books, the audience for the tournament of books, is they are highly, highly opinionated. <laughs> um, <That's true. laughs> As we find out in the comments after um, after uh, the tournament is over or after a match is over and people get to comment on the judgment and the um, terrible taste either the judge has or Kevin and I have <laughs> in terms of our opinions um, and it's sort of the best part of of the um, it is the best part of the tournament there's there's sort of no doubt um, I'm going to go with um, a writer named Mohsin Hamid, who uh, most recently had a novel, Exit West, which Great book. Um, was really good. But I'm, I'm going to go with an earlier book by him, How to Get Filthy Rich in Rising Asia, which is told in a bit of an experimental style. It's told in um, to some interesting things with chronology and chapters and, and covers a lot of ground and um, has a sort of satirical edge to it that is, is really fun. Um, he's a he's a sort of brilliant writer who does something different every time, and um, I think that energy will appeal to a tournament of books fan. Um, yeah, I like that. I'm going to go back to back to my uh, PowerPoint because I spent so much time on these. <laughs> um, cool. Is it up? Yep. Betty S. Okay, so Betty S. Um, I chose Betty S. because. Um, of normal people, all of again in the Dutch house. A lot of people are reading those books. Um, Ann Patchett is maybe the most read writer of people who ask me for recommendations. Um, so I wanted to get a list with her. And uh, for this person, I chose uh, The Seven Story oh. Mom by Thomas Merton, which right. is a bit of a wild card. Um, right. I am you Kevin, there? as you know, and uh, my family who my family who is paying attention, who is uh, online now, I am not a person of faith. Um, uh, I, I don't attend church except the one year I was sentenced to attend church uh, once a week when I lived in Lake Charles, Louisiana. Which I still maintain you need to write a book about. You can tell another time. <laughs> you um, need to write a book about it. It turns that. out that is unconstitutional, but they don't care about those things. You do. I should. I should. I, I wish I had really taken good <laughs> notes. It'll, it'll, be a, it'll be a bit of a memory, a memory jog at this point. Um, but uh, I read The Seven Story Mountain in college as extracurricular reading, not even for class. Um, I just I picked it up for some reason and started reading, and it's just an amazing story <laughs> of um, this personal journey of uh, Thomas Merton as yeah. he joins a Trappist monastery. And it's just some of the most beautiful writing you can imagine. Um, and the 
for this list, for, for Betsy's list, um, it's this spiritual stuff, right? It's this idea of this search for, for meaning. Um, and that brought to mind the Seven Story Mountain. Um, Jessica, this one I chose because it has geek love on it and I wanted to recommend geek love no matter what. And um, here it is on somebody's list. So I can just say people should read geek love. It's one of the craziest novels you ever read. Um, people who read it either wonder what's wrong with you for recommending it or it turns into their favorite book ever. Um, one of the ways I know that uh, my wife and I are compatible is we both love this book. Um, so there's some, uh, oh, and also I should, I should shout out The Lost Book of Adana Moreau, Michael Zapata, Chicago author. Um, it's gotten a lot of attention for, for this book. Um, so there's a bit of a mix here, like Geek Love and Jennifer Weiner are not the same types of books. Am I right, Kevin? I do not lie. Right. Oh, not right, exactly. But the, but they're but um, uh, why are so, you so much, why I love why the books are uh, fun the, though like I it's interesting her books are fun they're they're good they're fun reads they move quickly um so I picked this such a fun age by Kylie Reed um, because it both hits some of the the maybe a little deeper literary themes but this thing is a total page turner. Um, it's about um, a young woman, African American woman, who's who's a babysitter for a, a sort of yuppie. I don't know if there's yuppies anymore, um, but a, a relatively wealthy white couple. And um, she has to. T she takes the the child she's babysitting to the grocery store, and she's accosted um, by people in the grocery store who think she's kidnapping the child and uh, it becomes a, a scene and, and it's videoed. Um, there's obviously stuff going on in the news now that resonates with this. Um, so uh, it's got a lot of cultural touchstones, but it's also um, just really page turning read, riveting read. Um, one more I'll do and then we can get another live one. This is for Lowe. Um, House of Broken An Angels, Luis Alberto Urias. Yeah, I, see, I, I see a good one here. Yeah, the so. Serial Killer, Lincoln Braithwaite. That was the Tournament of Books. Uh, the Memory Police, Girl with Loud and Voice, The Course of Love. Um, these are all sort of um, odd, odd books, um, challenging books in a way, not necessarily hard, difficult to read, but um, out of the box books. So I chose uh, Oreo by Fran Ross, which was originally published in the 70s, recently reissued in the last few years, uh, I think by New Directions Press. Right. And it's just a funny, funny novel um, of a uh, mixed race, African-American and Jewish uh, female protagonist um, by a woman, Fran Ross. She, she passed away very young, but she was a, she was a writer for, um, she wrote jokes for Richard Pryor. Right, so, right. Um, that should be a sign of, of how um, how funny and how good she is. Right. Um, all right. So let's go to live. Yeah, I see. I I see one here. It's got a real Chicago bent to it, kind mm -hmm. of, but it's it's got some real twists. So I, I'm interested to see where you go here. All right. The Cooking Gene by Michael Twitty. Ghosts in the Schoolyard by Eve Ewing. Chicago, real hot Chicago uh, writer right now. Hunting Season by Andrea Camilleri. Uh, Talking to Myself by Studs Terkel. Mm. And No Name by Anthony Trollope. Oof, boy. Right? All right. That's uh, an interesting list. It's interesting. Studs Terkel, great Chicago writer. Um, I'll give just a general recommendation of Studs Terkel's Working. Yeah. Um, if you haven't read Working, it's absolutely one of the greatest books ever written. Um, it's a series of oral histories of people's jobs. And um, even though, I don't know, Kevin, do you know it was published in the 70s, maybe? 60s? I want to it's say old. it was um, late 60s, early 70s. I want to yeah, say it might have been the 70s. It's, um, so some of the jobs seem a little dated, but, but what's interesting about it is sort of work is work um, to, to, to read about. The labor is, is interesting. 
Um, he was one of the great interviewers of all time. Like you can get audio of his radio show. I think it was on here in Chicago. I don't know what station. And oh, what like he could, that man's interviews are. Yeah, he's yeah, actually, there's also, I can recommend some more, Studs Triple stuff. Um, uh, I think it's Melville House Press. They do a series called The Last Interview, where it's sort of the last oh, yeah. interview that famous authors did, including James Baldwin and right. um, those sorts of people. And a bunch of the last interviews were done by Studs, Studs oh, Triple. Yeah, that's um, awesome. And they're, they're just really, really good. Um, boy, okay, on the spot. Um, oh, well, I knew at some point I was going to, recommend something by Toni Morrison, but I like to go a little off the, off sort of the ones everybody knows, um, like Beloved and um, Blue Sky and, and those novels. And I'm going back, it's one of her later ones, I believe it was in the Tournament of Books, and it's Love um, by Toni Morrison. It's a, yeah. it's a slim book, it's maybe about 200 pages. Um, I wouldn't say it's a quick read, but it's got kind of all the stuff you like in Toni Morrison in a relatively uh, slim digestible um, package and she must have been in her 70s when she wrote it and still at the height of her powers so um, yeah love by Toni Morrison for, for that one. I love it. You want, can I give, do I give you another one here? Yeah give me another. All right uh, uh, I'm sorry I, I can't see I don't have the who the names of these people I gave them so I apologize but uh, When Truth Mattered by uh, Robert Giles Papa, a memoir, Gregory Hemingway. Catch and Kill by Ronan Farrow. Heartland by Sarah Smarsh. And oh, and I heard you paint houses, Charles Brandt, which was the source of The Irishman, the movie The Irishman, the Scorsese movie on the nine hour Scorsese movie on Netflix. Right. So a, mo a mob memoir. Ooh, okay, geez. That's good. Um, all right, I'm going to have to, so a lot of nonfiction. Yep. Um, doesn't mind a little darkness, but wants some, oh, I've got it, came to me. See, sometimes that happens. I start thinking and uh, that comes to me. Uh, I need to look it up in my browser to get the name of the author though. Um, yeah, there it is. So this book is called, um, now this book is infuriating to read. It's called <laughs> Dope Sick, Dealers, Doctors, and the Drug Company That Addicted America by Beth Macy, who, if I'm remembering correctly, is a, a newspaper reporter in um, like the Roanoke, Virginia area, uh, Southwest Virginia. And this is a kind of relatively granular story surrounding rooted in a community of the opiate crisis. And um, it is a cavalcade of bad actors, <laughs> of people with little or no regard for the well-being of other people. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's sort of a desperate American story. It's greed, it's, it's um, uh, carelessness, it's um, consultants who, um, help them learn to sell more drugs to people um, and make them more and more desperate. And um, I had to read a piecemeal. Um, I often, I don't know, do, do you read multiple books simultaneously? Kevin? I don't. Do you, I, I will read a, I, I read fiction and nonfiction simultaneously. But I won't read, I don't read two novels. Yeah, so that's what I do. So I always have a nonfiction book going yeah. and then a novel. So I was, I was interspersing this with fiction. I probably read four or five novels while I was reading this book because it was it, it's sort of overwhelming but it's a very powerful book of journalism so um dope sick I I um, definitely recommend all right I'm gonna go back to my yeah, list you can, you, can, you can look through see if you can pick another live one um Susan B uh this is another one I chose because it has two books I really love uh The End of Vandalism by Tom Drury um the End of Vandalism, he's, he's not a particularly well-known writer, but uh, there's a trilogy, The End of Vandalism uh, is the first of the trilogy. Uh, and I just love that book. Um, and in fact, I remember that I was reading it on my honeymoon. So I can, <laughs> uh, I can, I can place when I read it. 
Um, and, and then Severance by Ling Ma is a pandemic book um, about the Shen flu, which comes from a region in China and turns people into zombies, but not dangerous zombies. They, their zombieism is to, um, they repeat mundane tasks. So they'll like go into work and sit down at their computers and type at their thing, or they'll, right. they'll make dinner uh, for their families. Um, and it's, it's again, darkly humorous in a way, but um, if you can handle a book about pandemic during the pandemic, it's, it's a good one. Um, here's Trust Exercise by Susan Choi. This is one of my favorites from last year. Oh, yeah. Um, highly polarizing book. Great book. Um, an another pro tip on uh, using Amazon to find books you're going to like. Um, look for the books with three-star averages. A three-star <laughs> average means there are um, lots of people who give it five stars and lots of people who give it one star. And that means the feelings about it are passionate. So then you read the five star reviews and you see if these sound like people you might agree with about the world in general. Right. If you agree with them, you found a book you're going to like. If you read the one star reviews um, and you like these people are off the rockers, then this is going to be a book you like. Um, the one star reviews of, of Trust Exercise are actually pretty hilarious. Um, it, it does have a, a little bit of a twist, so you have to stick with it, but I think it's totally worth it. Yeah. But, um, I, I second that book. That book is great. And the, and you're right. You The first half of the book, you know something's wrong. You know something's off, but you don't, you can't put your finger on it and then right. it all comes together really beautifully. It's a great yeah. book. Um, so here's Scott W. from Lombard. Uh, another tip for those of you who write in and want to get in the column, if you put your hometown in, you go right to the top of the queue because <laughs> the Tribune will not let me publish a name with uh, out of hometown. Really? And it can be a hassle for me to write the person back and say, where are you from? So uh, that helps. Other tips on getting in, flattery works. Um, <laughs> I love your column. Makes me feel good. Um, why they can't write, uh, killing the five paragraph and other essays, revolutionized how I think about writing. These sorts of things tend to work on me. Um, I'm, I'm not, uh, not shy about enjoying the... Um, the praise. So here's another list where these are books that I have not read, um, although I am familiar with a couple of them, particularly The Art of Racing in the Rain. Um, so I, I looked them up, I, I got a sense of them, and uh, I came up with Lamb, the Gospel According to Biff, Christ's Childhood Pal by That's Christopher funny Moore. Book. Um, clearly somebody who, who doesn't, who likes humor, who can handle this kind of, um, this kind of approach. Um, this is a very funny book. Uh, Christopher Moore has written a number of funny books. He's, he, and, and he's one of these authors. Another thing I like to do with the column is if I can introduce people to an author they didn't know and they like a book and they have a nice uh, back catalog that, that they can dive into, then, then I've sort of set them up with a bunch of their next books. So yeah, if you cool. like one Christopher Moore novel, you like, you like them all. You'll like them all. I mean, they're not all quite equally as good, but they're... No. they're they're all of a vein. Right. right. If you like that kind of thing, you're going to like this kind of Chris thing. For more. Yeah. Um, Kamisha, these, again, a bit of a, a, bit of a um, varied list. Uh, Devil in White City, a good Chicago book, highly popular book. Everybody still is reading that, even though it's, it's quite old now. Get in Trouble, um, Kelly Link, those are short stories of um, interesting experimental vein. Um, and for her, I went with Homegoing by Yad Yassin, oh, another one of my favorite books of probably the last 10 years. Um, a book of linked short stories, sort of one story hands off the narrative to the next. Um, and it's um, sort of story of all the way from like um, the origin of the slave trade to present day, um, yeah. following this lineage. And, it's a brilliant um, novel. It's brilliant. just un unbelievable. And I think I think the author is like 28 or something. It's yeah. it's um, a little bit nauseating, but <laughs> amazing. Um, Autumn, uh, some interesting books, and again, books that that I don't know, and books that are really off the beaten path. Uh, Devil's Snake Curve, which looks really like a great book. I made a note for myself, um, published by a, a 
independent publisher, Coffee House, which is in Minneapolis. Um, so I didn't know these books, but I could look them up and tell they were a little bit off the beaten path, experimental. So I wanted to pick uh, Chicago's Jesse Ball, who was definitely off the path, experimental. You did that for me. You know I'm a Jesse Ball fan. I, I, it did not slip my notice that you would, uh, you would approve. Um, I did have a bit of a hard time choosing which Jesse Ball novel, right. um, but they're all good. They're all um, they're of a kind again, but they're all, they're they're very di each one is very different. And from what I've led to believe, he writes them very very quickly. Like he he sits down and gets them done in about a month, just in sort of a fit of of creativity, which is amazing. Um, one more, and then we'll do a live one. Um, Barbara G. Maybe you should talk to somebody. This one has a very long subtitle about the therapist, her therapist, somebody else's therapist. Um, I've not read it, but it's incredibly popular. It shows up all the time, and many people had it on their lists who were asking. Um, Department of Speculation, Jenny Awful, again, one of my, a book I really, really, really like. Um, but a, a mix of fiction and nonfiction, essays, um, experimental fiction. Um, I went with the book Chemistry, Waikiki Wang, which is a little bit, um, you know, as you know, Kevin, there's like these books every year that come out and they get a little bit of attention yeah. and um, it did win, it's, you can see it right there, won the Penn Hemingway, but then the, they start to fade into the background a little bit. And I, I begin to get nervous um, that we're going to forget about some of these books that were great. So every, I, I actually keep a list of like books that may slip out of our consciousness and every so often recommend it. And uh, Chemistry is one of them. It's a story of a, a, she's a student who's having a hard time um, dealing with school. Um, she's getting a PhD in chemistry and uh, having a, a bit of a breakdown. And again, it's kind of this mix of emotional and dramatic and funny that I seem to be drawn to. Um, okay, let's try a live one. Okay, I got, I got a good one here. It doesn't have any authors on it, but I, I, know, I know a few of them. Uh, Hummingbird's Daughter by uh, Luis Alberto Uria, again, another, one of my favorite Chicago authors. Uh, the Long Goodbye, that's Raymond Chandler. Mm -hmm. uh, All My Puny Sorrows, I know that book. The I Tolls, can't think yeah. Of. Oh, yeah. Or no, that's uh, All My Puny Sorrows is Miriam Toes. Okay. Taves, as in Jonathan Taves. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> uh, a Gentleman in Moscow? That's Amor Tolls, yeah. And they're there by Tommy Orange. Okay. Um, so that's a lot of like good selling, solid literary fiction. This is a real reader. You can tell like they're into books. They're picking up the thing other people are reading. Um, this is where, where I, I like to go back a little bit mm -hmm. um, to, to a book that I know is going to um, be of a quality that this person is used to, but maybe is not on their radar. And um, in this case, that's going to be The Known World by Edward P. Jones. Um, right. if, I don't know if people know him. This, he, he sort of spent something like 20 or 30 years writing this book. Yeah. Um, and it shows um, uh, sort of a narrative about African-American history, um, Virginia, state of Virginia. Um, actually, if, you, if those of you have read Ta-Nehisi Coates' The Water Dancer, it, it, it sort of covers some similar thematic and even geographic territory um, as that novel. So um, uh, The Known World, it, I consider it a classic. I still see it in bookstores, so I think people can. can yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's um, great. All right, uh, let's try another one. Yeah. Uh, Poisonwood Bible by Barbara King Saul. The Furious Hours, Murder, Fraud, and the Last Trial of Harpy Lee, Harper Lee by Casey Sepp. The Long Way Home, Louise Penny. Uh, Maybe You Should Talk to Someone, Lori Gottlieb. And once again, The Water Dancer by Ta-Nehisi Coates. Okay. Hmm. So again, some, some, read me the first two again. Uh, Poisonwood Bible. Okay. And a uh, nonfiction, The Furious Hours, Murder, Fraud, and the Last Trial of Harper Lee. Okay. So, mix of fiction and non, all pretty popular literary authors. Um, 
these these readers are sort are are kind of easy because I, I know <laughs> I, I can recommend just about anything. Every week I pick one of these lists for the column, so I don't have to think so hard. Um, in this case, I'm going to go a bit of a risk because these are short stories and not everybody likes short stories um but they are again sort of of a theme and if you read them together um they they, they can work as as a as a whole and it's a book called a manual for cleaning women by lucia berlin um came out a couple years ago posthumously um that's right and uh she's again one of these writers who when she was alive she was a writer's writer and she had some some personal demons um and has sort of been discovered um after after her passing and, and recognized as um you know just a great great writer who deserved more recognition um when she's alive okay i'm gonna i'm gonna rip through some of these because we're we're running low on time and i put together the powerpoint and i don't want to waste it um here's uh popular books these are outright popular books um furious hours our last reader or last recommender done that too a stephen king book um is on there although i think it's ph king now that i look at it and <laughs> catch and kill which is just an absolutely riveting read uh i went nonfiction. i went uh and i chose a book that if people have not read this they have to so good so good um bad blood secrets and lies in the silicon valley startup this is about um theranos the blood testing startup which is an absolute fraud. Um, it'll make you angrier than dope sick, <laughs> possibly. Yeah. Um, what's interesting to me about Bad Blood too is some of the most respected and powerful people in the country were taken in by this thing. We're talking former Secretary of State George Shultz, uh, James Mattis, yeah. um, Bill Clinton. Um, all these people were taken in by what is apparent in the, in the story. Uh, a fraud, a phantom, something that never existed. Um, all of Walgreens. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and it's, it's really an unbelievable story. And it's a little on the nose because it's a lot like Catch and Kill and that yeah. the author of Bad Blood becomes targeted by the subject he's researching. Right. But it gives you a real appreciation for what a journalist has to go through to, to bring these sorts of things to light. And I, I highly recommend the audiobook of that. Too. He, oh he, yeah, Harry reads it himself. It's great. He's great. I've only listened to snippets of it, but I hear it's great. And there's there's uh, <coughs> it's it's really fantastic. Yeah. Um, another list for Grace B. Make it scream, make it burn. Those are essays. Leslie Jamison, classly and um, classic, unbearable lightness of being. Uh, the friend, which came out a couple years ago, won um, maybe won the National Book Award if I'm remembering. Uh, Salt slow and the most fun we ever had. Um, I went with essays and another book I just wanted to recommend since I have a captive audience. Um, it was a, a book I touted uh, the week it came out in 2019. I said, this is going to be a, 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 our next great public thinker, Tracy McMillan Cobham. Um, I was correct. <laughs> I can pat myself on the back. <laughs> she, as you can see there, a national award finalist, national book award finalist. Um, she's a professor. Uh, she was at Virginia Commonwealth. She's um, moving to University of North Carolina for the fall. And I actually had the pleasure of interviewing her um, for um, public books. Uh, if you look at public books, Tracy McMillan Cotton, you can see our, our interview. And she, um, she is very, very powerful and a persuasive thinker. And um, I love her writing. Um, Sam, again, I chose this because of some of the popular books on it, and um, oh. it, <laughs> this one was for Kevin too. Uh, picked a book again that slipped out a little bit of of um, people really knowing it. A book called Skippy Dies from Paul Murray, but is really um, I see it as like a book that could be a classic along the lines of like um, a John Irving novel, like The yeah. World According to Garp, or, or, yeah. or those sort, those sorts of books. Just a kind of classic story coming of age novel it's about um i've got it on my shelf here it's like 800 pages it's a it's a very satisfying satisfying read um, still i think in the history of the tournament of books 
the the uh, the loss of Skippy dies still to this day, I think engenders more anger and regret and heartache than any other book in. in the it was a blow. It was a blow. Uh, the tournament, the tournament of books, it's really hard because um, Kevin and I we spend sort of weeks knowing what the books are. We um, have read them and write about them before anybody else sees, and then when the audience, you know, when when the judge gets them and the results come in, you can just be heartbroken in an instant. <laughs> Like the, this book you were sure was gonna win the title uh, doesn't go anywhere. Um, Rachel E. here, Lost Children Archive. A uh, recent book, Bastard Out of Carolina, um, classic, very tough read, Dorothy Allison, um, Hidden Valley Road, Inside the Mind of an American Family, nonfiction, The Collector, John Fowles, which is a very, very strange yeah. um, novel. And of course, classic persuasion. I lean towards the, Classic but contemporary with this, with Possession by A.S. Byatt. Uh, most people know her more for um, Wolf Hall. Uh, um, but this was this was uh, before that, and she um, it's it's a it's a, a mystery romance. Um, two graduate students sort of uh, sussing out the um, uh, mystery behind the letters of a a um, couple of poets from uh, days past. So again, a novel that stuck with me over the years. Um, Jessica of Oak Park, On Earth We Are Briefly Gorgeous, Ocean Vuong, um, that I predicted would, would win the Pulitzer Prize and it did not. <laughs> uh, the Great Believers by uh, Chicago Land's Rebecca McKay, that's a, a wonderful book about the AIDS crisis in Chicago. Um, just so impressed on how she wrote about in an era she was barely alive for um, and brings it to life. There's Ann Patchett again, showing up a lot, uh, and Ian Martell. I chose The Intuitionist by Colson Whitehead, not that he needs any help selling books. He just won his second consecutive Pulitzer Prize for The Nickel Boys. But I want to remind people of his first novel, right. Intuitionist, which was published in, I want to say, 1999, 2000. I remember, so very, good. I so remember good. very distinctly reading this. Um, Colson Whitehead and I are about the same age. Um, I remember reading it and realizing that we were about the same age and I was an aspiring writer and thinking, well, I, I may be an aspiring writer, but I don't think I can aspire to this. This guy is just in an absolutely different league. A book about a guy who inspects elevators with his mind. Yeah, it's um, brilliant. It's so it's, good. It's, it's super inventive and brilliant and philosophical and deep and all that stuff. And, and very um, different from his later novels. I think very different. Yeah. More conventional, but it's so good. It's, it's, um, it's great. Uh, Kelsey, again, moving quickly. Um, I think it's the last one of my slides before we uh, maybe get another live one and I'll, we'll sign off. Um, A Brave Man, Seven Stories Tall by Will Chancellor. Here's another book I really love that's that, um, I featured in the column, I wrote a whole column about it the, the year it came out. And um, I, from what I was told by the author, it, it gave him enough juice to maybe do another book, which is awesome because it's a really interesting book. Um, the main character is a um, Olympic level water polo athlete for Stanford who um, uh, gets poked in the eye and loses his, his um, ability to play water polo and then gets wrapped up in the European art scene. And um, it's very hard to describe, but it's right. pretty crazy. And for somebody who has read House of Leaves, mm -hmm. um, yep. it certainly won't be too strange. <laughs> right, right, um, right. <laughs> uh, so I think, I think she'll, I think I'll see like, um, so maybe, maybe a couple more. Or did you, 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 all right, you want to do another live one? You, I know you also have some uh, books for pandemic. Uh, yeah, let's do, uh, let's do, what are we, we're at 831. Let's do two more live ones and then we'll get to the pandemic. Thank everybody for spending time. With okay. Us. Uh, all right. Here's a good one. This is after you have a name here. Monica from Chicago. Uh, she has Timbuktu by Paul Auster, The River by Paul Heller, Consequences by Penelope Lively, Wonderland, Jennifer Cody Epstein, and London Bridges by Jane Stevenson. Hmm. All right, I gotta look up that last one real quick. Yeah, I don't know that I one don't. either. I should correct myself, the Wolf Hall is by- uh, Yeah, well, Hillary Mantel. Mantel. We got that. Um, 
London Fist, was that the one? That was the last one, yeah. By Jane Stevenson. Jane Stevenson. Uh, it doesn't come up first because uh, James Patterson wrote a book called <laughs> London Bridges. That's sort of the worst, uh, that's sort of the worst thing you can possibly do is write a book with the same title as James Patterson or have him, him write a book with the same title as me. Um, I'm looking at my list. Um, all right, so here's one. Um, a, another author I really like named A.M. Holmes mm -hmm. and uh, a novel called May We Be Forgiven, which is a bit of an oddball book again, but one that, um, and it's just, it's just unique. Yeah. And um, you've never read anything like it. And um, if, if you like it, it's it's a book you're gonna love. Um, all right, one more and one more, and then I'll I'll do my pandemic okay. lists. And all right, uh, uh, this one is this one's interesting too. Right? Uh, Mirror and the Light by Hilary Mantel. She keeps coming up. Uh, Splendid in the Vile by Eric Larson. American Dirt. Uh, uh, the Last Train to London by Meg White. Meg Waite Clayton. Mm -hmm. And summer of '69. Who's that one by? Uh, Hild Hildebrand. It says I don't know the. Oh, Aaron Hildebrand. Sure. Um. All right. I'm gonna. I'm, gonna, I'm doing a little furious googling. <laughs> Watching the sausage get made. I say there's a really you know uh, American Dirt is kind of a, a wrench in that to me because there's so much controversy and so much stuff surrounding it. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it was, that was an interesting phenomenon. I, I did, I wrote a column about that where um, I began to get irked by the backlash to the backlash. Right, right. Um, where, you know, a lot of late, what I thought were lazy critiques of the backlash, where it's like, oh, this cancel culture stuff. And um, the reality was the original critiques of it were that it's not a good book. <laughs> not that a uh, you know non-immigrant woman can't write a book about immigration. Right. Um, it's um, the unfortunate part is that sort of critique of the critique delays a much more interesting yeah. conversation. Yep. And so I wrote the column, kind of like let's let's talk about this thing as a as a book, as the people who are originally critiquing the story right. intended. Um, so I got a little, I got a little bent out of shape. So I'm going to go with another, uh, just author in general. I recommend, um, but I, Kevin, I know you love her too, Kate Atkinson, oh, yeah. um, and Case Histories, yeah. oh, so good. Um, Jackson Brody novels. So good. Once you start your first Jackson Brody novel, you've got uh, four or yeah. five others to read, um, and it can be difficult to to um, control yourself. And she has some other really interesting. Uh, books too, Life After Life, which is a bit of an experimental World War II book. But, um, I, but I think, cool. like in general, probably better known for the more literary novels, but yeah, those she, she, novels are she so She started good. as a, yeah. her first book was not a, a Jackson Brody, but she be, sort of became known for these Jackson Brody. He's a, he's a former cop. Um, I don't know if he's formally a private eye. He gets wrapped up in mysteries and because he's a man of, of purpose, he, um, he feels... Um, honor bound to solve them. Um, and he's, he's just a great character, really satisfying stuff. Yep. Um, all right, so let's close with um, some of my uh, pandemic recommendations. And I assume City Lit will honor these as well if you want the 10% off. Um, let's make City Lit go broke with <laughs> our discounts by buying some books. Um, so if you need a good satisfying cry, and what I mean by that is one of the pleasures of reading for me is this feeling of catharsis, of a vicarious experience of emotion um, through another person's consciousness. And um, books can transport you in a way no other media can. It's, um, I read about this all the time, how books are the, the best virtual reality ever invented. There is no other technology that allows you to lose track of time in the way a book does. Um, and any reader, particularly anybody who's tuning into this nonsense, um, <laughs> knows what that's like, right? Knows what it is to lose time to reading. So um, 
I compile these um, as ones that I just remember like being just really, really um, absorbing. Anything is Possible by Elizabeth Strout, which um, her, her best known book is Olive Kitteridge and then Olive Again. This comes in between those and it's a series of linked stories about, um, you know, sort of small town life and, and the people trying to make the best of it. And uh, that's a great one. Um, the Explanation for Everything, Lauren Grodstein, um, deals with disease. It has some death and dying in it, but um, again, sort of a beautiful book about family. Um, I did want to recommend My Wife Said You Wanted to Marry Me by Jason B. Rosenthal. I started it um, yesterday and finished it today. Um, very, you know, it's, it's just really powerful um, story of, of moving on from, from a family tragedy. Um, Don't Skid Out on Me by Willie Vlotten. Um, his books have been made into a couple movies and called Dear Pete, if you, if you know that movie. Um, this has an end that is rough. <laughs> I will not lie. Um, but it'll trigger emotions in you. Um, I'm including a short story. It's a story called A Father's Story by Andre de Buse, um, which you could get in any of his collected works, or you can probably just Google it online. Um, I've taught this story probably about 20 times, and it's sort of hard to keep my emotions in check when I uh, read it to, to students or in front of students. Um, it's a, the story of a father whose daughter has done something um, very, very bad, and he's a devout Catholic, and he's, he's trying to figure out how to reconcile his faith with what he thinks he needs to do to protect his daughter. Um, and then Telephone by Percival Everett, which I just read, and a shout out to the crowd. So if people aren't aware, um, Gray Wolf, the publisher of, uh, of this, has, um, I gotta stop the share for one second so I can show myself in the big. Gray Wolf has published this in three separate editions. And I want to read all three, <laughs> but I only have one. So um, you can tell the editions, I'm gonna hold this up to the screen, hopefully people can see this. Um, the additions are marked by having a different color on the colophon on the spine, red, yellow, and blue. So I have two extra reds that I would trade anybody for yellow and blue. So if you, you have, or blue, you want to trade for red, hit me up. Is there a difference in the text between the books? Yeah, there's a difference in the text. Um, the story is different. And um, it's my goal to write a column about it. But I can't do it until I've actually read all three <laughs> versions. So I and and there's no way. I, I I've been calling bookstores to see if they have it, and it's right. the publisher won't. Gray Wolf does not sell direct. It's become a real hassle. Um, lastly, a book called All This Could Be Yours by Jamie Attenberg, uh, who's a Chicago area native. This I read last fall, and it's uh, again about a troubled family and um, just sort of has an ending that sneaks up on you. Yeah, very good. All right, enough of those. If you're looking for a diversion, if you want something that's going to take your mind off things, um, these books are, to my view, transporting. And uh, the first is Life Among the Savages by Shirley Jackson, who is more well known for um, her horror, mm -hmm. um, like The Lottery, Haunting of Hill House, these sorts of books. But she also wrote like kind of Irma Bombeck-like essays about her family. And they're very, very funny. Um, and they were recently reissued and I read them on them. Um, where'd you go, Bernadette, Bernadette Maria Semple? Go-to recommendation for me. Uh, everybody loves that book. Everybody loves it. It's a very funny novel. It's highly readable. It's got a great plot. It has a film version that is inexplicable. Yeah. <laughs> it's by Richard Linklater, who's normally a good filmmaker, but the, the, the movie is... I watched 20 minutes of it and it, it has very little resemblance to the book. <laughs> um, Fraud by David Rakoff, um, who uh, Kevin and I both had the pleasure to meet once and uh, was a longtime contributor to This American Life. Um, those who don't know him, his essays are, are in the vein of somebody like David Sedaris, um, but more purposefully experiential. He would go out and do something to report back. And there's an essay in this um, where he goes to a spiritual retreat run by Steven Seagal, <laughs> um, who is a um, Buddhist master. 
And um, his recounting of this is just hilarious. The audiobook is fantastic too. He reads it and he's, he's got a great voice. And he passed away, um, God, it's probably close to 10 years ago now, but he's a, an amazing writer, an amazing person. A, a classic from my childhood, Wanda Hickey's Night of Golden Memories. That one's for uh, Mother Bibli Oracle, <laughs> who uh, introduced me to Gene Shepard. Everybody actually already knows Gene Shepard. If you've seen the movie A Christmas Story, um, it's based on these essays um, in this book. And, and he narrates that movie, doesn't he? He, he narrates them in, yeah. in, the, in the, he's the narrator in A Christmas Story. Very funny essays um, set in um, uh, Northern Indiana, sort of an industrial town. So Midwesterners uh, will identify with them. Maybe they're dated. I don't know. They're, they were dated when I, I read them. Okay. You know, they're like about the 50s. And I thought they were hilarious in the 70s and 80s. So I think they'll work for anybody. Um, Hyperbole and a Half by Ellie Brosh. It's a, it's a graphic book um, based on her comic. Um, it has a, a section on her two dogs, um, one of whom is reminiscent to one of my dogs. So I find it um, particularly, particularly funny. Um, it's a hilarious book about being anxious and depressed, believe it or not. Um, but it's very, very good. Um, and lastly, a book by Charles Portis, who um, is more known for True Grit, um, but is just a really, really, um, was a really unique and um, hilarious writer whose books, um, they travel under their own momentum. You just start going and the story gets rolling and there's never a lot of plot. They are, um, pardon the pun on the title, but they're literally shaggy dog stories. They're just the, and then, and then, and then. But they're very inventive and funny and highly verbal. And um, I love all his books, but I'm gonna recommend The Dog of the South specifically. So, nice planned, but um, this was fun. Thanks for everybody who hung in there. There's still 95 people. I yeah, think we've missed out at some times. Um, what should we remind them of, Kevin? What, what do we need to, to tell people? Uh, order, uh, you found a book you like tonight, order it from City Lit, please. Uh, John, your column is in the Chicago Tribune, but is, is, is it in other Tribune newspapers too? Uh, sometimes it'll show up in the yep. papers. Um, Occasionally it shows up in the Hartford Current for whatever reason. I don't know, I don't know what the syndication deal is there. Yeah, every Sunday, um, uh, buy my books, buy Kevin's books. Um, uh, his, his memoir, Driving to the Gap, is, um, <laughs> I could have put it on the list of books if you need a good cry. <laughs> um, it's it's uh, the story of um, Kevin and his father. Uh, Kevin's father was... Um, long time involved in various positions in major, major baseball, including at the Baseball Hall of Fame. And it's the story of what happened to the bat that Roberto Clemente did or did not um, hit, get his 3,000th hit with. So it's a mystery. It's, it's a family story, her son's story. It's great. Um, you can order it through bookstores. You can order it direct from um, Field Notes, Chicago Company. Um, so yeah, check that out. And uh, thanks, Teresa. Yeah, thanks, thank Jordan. You. And um, maybe we'll do it again. Um, Teresa, guys. if you have anything to thank say. Thank you. This was amazing. Thanks to both of you. It was wonderful. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you. And, yeah, we will do it again. Yeah. And everyone, uh, call or call City Lit Books or um, go to our website, and you'll get ten percent off on any recommendations from tonight. So thanks so much. Take care, everybody. Stay safe. Bye, everybody.